Hello, I'm Earl Buski. Dr. Hygienus Leon took office on the first Monday of May 2021 as president of the Caribbean Development Bank, becoming its sixth chief executive. The seasoned economist has spent his first 100 days leading the regional multilateral institution with a team of more than 200 employees at the CDB's headquarters in Bridgetown, Barbados. He was selected uh, for the uh, top regional post at the region's uh, top uh, bank uh, with 35 years of experience in economics, financial policy development, and executive management, as well as more than 20 of which was spent working with the International Monetary Fund. Dr. Leon took his seat at the CDB's headquarters in Barbados, like I said, in May, acknowledging that he'd inherited what he said back then was, and I quote, a solid foundation for the evolution of a financially strong bank that responds to the developmental needs and priorities of its borrowing member countries, which foundation has been laid by his five predecessors. The president succeeded Dr. William Warren Smith in the 21st year of the 21st century and is the fifth to step in the shoes of founding President Sir Arthur Lewis five decades later to guide the region's banking development thrust from its impressive and sprawling Barbados headquarters complex at Wilde in a way that the region can really bank on. 100 days on the job, Dr. Leon has agreed to converse with us about his mission, the challenges and the opportunities, his experiences uh, in the job, and of course, he is also going to share with us, like I said, how he spent his first quarter at the bank's helm in the middle of a global pandemic, and whether the ambitious goals he set at the outset are in fact being met. We're talking here about Caribbean development and of course about not just Dr. Leon having the same alma mater as Sir Arthur Lewis, but also talking about his first deep dive into economic theory at a college named after Sir Arthur. So here is our conversation. Dr. Leo, thanks for uh, agreeing to have this conversation with us. Welcome to UETV Global, and uh, thanks for agreeing to converse with us, like I said, on your first 100 days uh, in office as the bank's president. Now, you have admitted that you inherited a solid foundation laid by your predecessors uh, for the evolution of a financially strong bank that responds to the development needs and priorities of its member countries. And during your first three months, months or 100 days, you jumped into the pool at the deep end. In fact, you started cutting your teeth with a rough file, a visit to St. Vincent and the Grenadines following the uh, devastating April earthquake and volcano eruption, uh, visits to member states to share your vision uh, and to offer the bank's assistance in uh, fighting the effects of the COVID pandemic. And then uh, came another <coughs> earthquake in Haiti and another hurricane, and you've been to Jamaica and now in St. Lucia. Did you take a good job at the bad time? <laughs> Thanks a lot, Earl. <clears throat> um, one can be tempted to, to, to say that, but I, I, I think there, there is really, um, I, I like to say there's no good time to do policy, and there's no bad time to do policy. Uh, policy just has to be done. And so from, from my vantage point, uh, yes, we, we have very, very significant challenges that have just uh, come to bear. Uh, you mentioned the St. Vincent uh, Haiti 
COVID, the hurricane season that, that's here. These are all happening at, at one point, a constellation. But I, I like to remind uh, people that before COVID, we had a, a lot of issues, uh, structural issues that the, the region was, was grappling with. Uh, and so it's a continuum. Um, the, the, the structural weaknesses were there. Then you had COVID that intensified it. And I like to say equally, there's a futuristic element, which is the whole climate change and the impact that's likely to be there. So we really do not have the liberty of time. We don't have the room to say, well, we need to settle in. I think the, the region needs the, the bank now. And so I am here as I have been going out to other countries to start that process, that consultation, uh, where we can help, how we can help. Um, and it's an immediate issue. And um, I would have done it the same way if we didn't have COVID, but uh, COVID is not for me an impediment to not go out there because that, that's what the, the job is about. Good to hear. And of course, uh, every one of your predecessors, every one of the five, uh, would have had enough time to prepare mm -hmm. uh, for the mission. And in your case, you will have entered with <coughs> a vision and a sure. mission and primary objectives. And your vision for the bank calls for three things I've noted, a comprehensive yeah. development approach mm -hmm. across the region to reimagine for for sustainability, mm -hmm. to rebalance for systemic integrity, and to reposition mm -hmm. uh, for competitive advantage yep. and effectiveness. Do you still maintain that tripartite vision? Yeah. Uh, or has it been altered by unseen, unexpected, and unavoidable events? And then we have your primary objectives to support uh, member countries through the uh, COVID-19 recovery uh, to contribute more uh, to their harmonious development and growth and to promote cooperation and integration among them. So how has all that been? Is the bank off to a good start? Uh, well, first, um, I, I think the, the tripartite you talked about uh, that is a philosophy. Mm -hmm. uh, and because it is a philosophy, it, it is the bedrock, the foundation of what you do. And so it, it's not going to change. Mm -hmm. And I'll, I'll explain what I mean by that and probably segue to the second part of the question um, as to whether we've got Primary enough to... Yes. Mm -hmm. um, essentially, we are miniature ecosystems. So we have the, the big ecosystem, the planet, mm -hmm. um, that, or if you want the planetary system, that has eight now, not nine, planets. Mm -hmm. And th that are held together. And they move as one. And that holding together in my mind is simply the result of gravity. So one constant, one system moving together. One, one planet cannot move one quarter of one degree, else the whole thing goes crazy. So when I say we are miniature, let, let's think of economies in the same form. Mm. An economy now is an ecosystem. Mm. Um, and that ecosystem has to be seen as the eight planets, or the six planets in, in that particular state. I call them spheres. And those spheres need to be held by something equivalent to the gravity that we are talking about. Um, and that something, I think, for me, if I can pick one word, would be confidence. When that holds, then all the spheres move in tandem. The confidence would be the glue that it's the holds glue, everything It's the together. glue equivalent to the gravity that's holding the planets. But that confidence, once it's there, holds the spheres of the ecosystem together. And so when we, when we start talking about development, which is what we are in the business for, first and foremost, I think we, we have to start by saying development is a holistic concept. It's not a slice. It's not one aspect, it's a holistic concept. And therefore, by the same 
logic of what we are saying, you cannot leave any part of development behind. Yeah. It has to be the whole thing. And so I, I've, I've started from that perspective and says, because it's an ecosystem, and because we need to target all things at the same time, we need to be able to understand how do things go forward. Now, how do things go forward is a function of that anchor that we talked about. We are in the line with an objective of sustained economic development. Now, what exactly does sustained mean? For it to be sustained, it means you need to be able to keep it at a steady level. If it's going to stay at a steady level, you think of a plane flying, all the engines have to be such that it can stay at that level. Now, it can drop a little, as planes do, when they go down altitude, but you must be able to come back up. If you cannot come back up, then it means you cannot sustain yourself. You're going to fall, and then you crash. So sustainable development translates now to resilient development. In other words, without resilience, the ability to bounce back when you take a dip, or if you are going too fast to move back down, that sort of staying in that corridor, if you don't have resilience, then you really cannot attain sustainability. And to be able to rebuild, to be able to allow yourself to propel forward, I think there's only one game in town, and that's the game of innovation. Because innovation is what allows you to transform what you know into something that you are doing and make it better. And so it's that transformation that allows you now to maintain change. When you're too high to too low, you drop to go back as a means of keeping that sustained effort that we are talking about. So I've, I've narrowed this down into essentially those three words. Sustained development is promoted through resilience, and resilience occurs through innovation. Mm -hmm. Now, once you establish that, and that's now your, your platform, the question really is, how do you effect that? And that's where the methodology of the tripartite comes in. Mm -hmm. It says, first, I need to know where my goal is. What does sustained economic development mean? And that is simply the question of reimagining. And reimagining says, uh, we say we reimagine for sustainability. Okay, I told you what sustained meant. Mm -hmm. Reimagine for sustainability now says, what do we need to conceptualize? What do we need to think about? To maintain that to sustainability. To keep us with a concept of sustainability. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's the reimagining component. Now, the fact that we are here today it means that we are not clearly in a sustainable state because that's where we want to go. So there has to be, therefore, some tensions that exist in that ecosystem where part is in front, part is behind. And so you need to first redress that. And that's, so that's the rebalancing phase. Rebalancing says we know we are not yet there. What we now need to do is to maneuver, shift, rebalance to now put us on the beginning of a track going forward. Mm -hmm. And now once we can rebalance, we get to the third phase. The third phase now is your repositioning. Because you are clearly not yet where you want to be, but now you need to reposition to get you to where you want to be, which is now the trajectory that you're going to do. So my concept of the reimagining rebalancing and repositioning, as I say, is a philosophy. <coughs> and that philosophy now is how do I guide a trajectory to take me from where I am to the next stage. And so that, that's the, the, the basis of, 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 that, of that perspective. The natural question, which is your, your second question, is in the first 100 days, I guess, what, uh, what can we say? Um, in terms of that process. In terms of application yes. of that theory. And the application has to, I think, have two parts. The first is to recognize that where we are now in a COVID state, which, as we said, has aggravated the previous structural issues we had, we are in rescue mode. 
Rescue means what can we do now to simply help countries survive? And that's what uh, the international community, the CDB, the governments have been putting together. Lockdowns, purchase of equipment, restrictions, and that kind of stuff. But once you move from recovery, from rescue, you need to go into recovery, which in a sense is a type of rebalancing mm -hmm. that we, we are talking about. But it's not yet the repositioning. Mm -hmm. And so... It's like following a hurricane. You rescue first and precisely. then you... Then you, you recover, you recover. bring things together, but then you need to move to, to the move, next yeah. stage, which is the repositioning. So to, and because I've said that that sustainable growth that we are talking about is built on resilience, we have mapped out and as I have been discussing with all governments that I go out, we have mapped out there are five key elements of resilience that define this ecosystem that we are talking about. Uh, the first is um, social resilience. And social resilience is focused, as it were, on people, health, education, skills, development, gender-related issues, inequity, um, rural, urban tensions, uh, security. All of those would fall under social resilience. And by that, we are saying when any one of those things are not optimal, we need to find ways of bringing them back. Else, you stay in that uh, lower state that you never recover from. And therefore, you can never attain the sustained notion that we are talking zone. Precisely. So social resilience is one. Um, the second, they call it productive capacity resilience. Mm -hmm. And we can all identify with that. It says a hurricane wipes you out. You cannot produce because your capital has been wiped out. Mm -hmm. So you need, again, a way of pulling yourself out <clears throat> of that to a state that you can sustain. The third is uh, financing resilience. And financing resilience is about now the ability to access and raise funds <clears throat> when you need it to allow you to go to the next stage. Then we have institutional resilience. And institutional resilience now is very, very key because as we can see now, capacity to implement has fallen or maybe has never been there. And that is part of the whole institutional structure of government, of economies that are down but need to be boosted. So how do we do that? And the last element is environmental resilience. Mm -hmm. And that's to do clearly with what people are talking about, the, the climate. But notice how I have talked of five things. Social, people, um, capital, finance, there's um, production in terms of how I blend those together institutions that make it happen, the environment within which we live, these are elements that make up an ecosystem. So far with me? Mm -hmm. So that ecosystem is what we need to be able to keep moving. And so when we talk then of resilience for growth, I'm saying we need to tackle all of those elements. We cannot leave any Anyone one of them out behind, or behind, out. But clearly, there are many elements in that bag. Mm -hmm. And so we cannot really talk of doing all of them at one time. In fact, we won't have money to do all of them at one time. So it forces us to say we need to prioritize. We need to indicate which we want to do now, which is more urgent, which is more relevant. And so on that basis, CDB um, has now agreed and we are pushing forward an agenda that we believe is mapping some of those. And we are saying to governments, this is what we think the region should be focused on. So that's now, as it were, bringing it more concrete. The first is under the social resilience bucket. We think the most important um, element to be worked on is education. Mm -hmm. And I would say health with it because you need health to do everything. But education is, for me, the, the, the prime social resilience element that we would like to highlight. Um, institutional... The ingredient for development. Exactly. Institutional resilience, we think we need to tackle the implementation capacity deficit. For too long, for too many decades, not years, decades, 
anybody who tells you anything about the region, it's implementation, implementation, implementation. So we need to make that a pillar to build resilience. Mm -hmm. the, the third, obviously, is climate resilience. So we need to champion the whole idea now of how do we generate this climate change aspects, embed it, mainstream it in, in all policies. Uh, the fourth is productive capacity. And in productive capacity, I think we need to pull out one thing, economic diversification. How do we promote economic diversification? And the last, of course, when you pull those together is resilience now to managing external shocks, which comes essentially from a broad-based set of economic policies that you put together. So you have elements, not the totality, but elements from each of those spheres that we talked about, <coughs> uh, with the exception of finance, mm -hmm. that we are championing as elements that are needed to allow us to take that ecosystem going forward. Mm -hmm. And on the financial side, um, that bucket of financing is, I'm treating it separately, because it's not totally within the control of the governments. It may require capital from the private sector, capital from donors in terms of concessional financing, our own capital in terms of CDB, uh, whether it's from retained or from membership or new capital in injection. But we can blend those and marry those together and say we now have an integrated uh, perspective of an ecosystem that if we implement policies on, will actually give us a high chance of maintaining this sustained economic development that we are talking about. And once you've laid that agenda, which is what I have been doing for the last uh, 100 days, um, starting, with the, starting with the inaugural and um, with the various governments that have been going to even summer on the duress, uh, once you've laid that agenda, then it is now a matter of getting consensus building a dialogue, engaging with the governments on what they would like to do that fit those structures, and providing advice, working with them where we can on financing, um, and at the same time technical assistance, the three things that CDP does, as a means now of trying to help them create craft, now a internally consistent set of policies that can meet those goals while at the same time ensuring that the development ecosystem can actually proceed. So that in a nutshell is I think where we are. So if I can, I don't want to give myself a score, but I'd surely say we, we have started that dialogue. Um, reaction response has been positive, I think, so far. Of course, the devil is always in the details, but I, I think you, you need to first establish that framework. And if you have a framework, and you can start breaking down, then every government can exercise its right as sovereign governments to propose, and we can be the trusted advisor, um, helping them think through, checking what they are doing, how they intend to do it, and hopefully we can overcome this implementation deficit issue we talked about, and we will actually get things done. And so I would say, let's see how the next year, two years go, but I, I am very, encouraged and I'm um, hopeful that I think we and optimistic and optimistic that we we have an opportunity to to make a change and, and a difference in, in in the region going forward when I I, I read your bio ahead of your <coughs> taking office between your uh, appointment mm -hmm. selection election yeah. at mm -hmm. the time um, I can't remember seeing anywhere that you were school principal <laughs> um, but uh, you, you have, in the last few minutes, um, taken us um, through astrology, yeah. geography, yeah. economics, social science, yeah. uh, politics, yeah. uh, sustainability, yeah. environment, yeah. climate change. Yeah. I mean, your entire 35 years was yeah. presented in less, <laughs> uh, less than 35 minutes. But um, some of the <clears throat> issues that you have raised go into the other one that I want to um, talk about, and that is going forward. And mm -hmm. You said about going forward back in May that the bank would need to emphasize innovation, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, generate and refine new ideas or 
and create opportunities, enhance <coughs> measurement and evaluation for more effective implementation, yeah. foster <coughs> effective <coughs> partnerships and yeah. knowledge sharing to yeah. promote transformation, to build on the region's collective ingenuity and experience and to improve the quality of life uh, for the bank's uh, citizens. <laughs> this sounds like a, a wholesome 21st century manifesto for Caribbean development yeah. and improving the lives of the tens of millions of uh, citizens of uh, borrowing member states. Uh, but how feasible is this among borrowing member countries of vast differences ranging from the size of population to economics in a, a constantly changing world system that's not been kind to developing countries yeah. like the Caribbean? It sounds like a big bite to me. Are you sure the bank won't choke? <laughs> not at all. Um, <laughs> First, um, let, let's understand what this, uh, what this really boils down to. Um, one is, you say, 10 million lives. But that is exactly what we should be wanting to do. That, that's the essence of where we are going. We, we want there to be sustainable livelihoods for all, period. Mm -hmm. Across the board. Across the board. Uh, you want there to also be a sense of connectivity that says, as a people, as a region, we know, we understand, we, we can identify with each other. In the same way, we can talk of global connectivity at the digital level, where we can say we would like to be in a point where every person in the region has access to broadband. Yeah? Um, and we can equally well say we want us to be an innovation hub, a place mm -hmm. where innovation thrives. Mm -hmm. Now, I mean, I, I, I put them in that form, but those, to me, those four things, the connectivity, the sustainable livelihoods, um, the, the, um, <clears throat> the innovation. innovation hub uh, that I talked about, being agile, nimble, these are goals that we can set ourselves. Now, the moment we can set those goals, the question is, how do we set those goals? We can set those goals purely from the principle of um, our imagination, bounded, unbounded imagination, which is what I think we as a people can lay claim to. We have adequate and sufficient intellectual capacity that we can state we can only be limited by the lack of our imagination. Mm -hmm. Or conversely, how far we can aspire is only limited by our unbounded imagination. Mm -hmm. And so if I start from that perspective, then those big ticket items that I talk about, that is my imagination of what I think I see people being. As long as I can get I tend, there. I tend to describe that as fertile imagination. Fertile imagination. As long as I can get there, then everything we say is possible. The only way we can now make it happen is through the two tools we said, resilience and innovation. And that is where the innovation comes in. And so I, I think of this as um, a three-tier structure. It's not as, as, as big as it sounds. The first tier is resilience. And I've already told you the different buckets of resilience. We'll chip away at it one every year. So time, it may take time. It's not mm -hmm. gonna happen overnight, mm -hmm. but we chip away at it. The second tier now is to say, once we know it's resilience, the question really is, what is the foundation that we need to be able to build that resilience? And that foundation is captured in uh, a phrase I used in my inaugural, uh, measure better to target better, okay? Now, measure better to target better says, if I want to get somewhere, I want to target something, I need to be able to measure it. I need to know what it's about, what it's influenced by, how do I change it? So that's that measurement side and understanding, and that's a foundation. 
And that understanding is, in essence, I want to be able to link this to the SDGs because that's a measure of what we want to be. But even SDGs, if you think about this well, uh, we talk of the meeting... The United Nations yes, Special Development correct. Goals. Uh, the, the SDGs, we name them, but nobody is saying where exactly do the, we need to get. Is it to the best in the world? Is it to a threshold? Is it to the top 10%? We are not defining that. We need to set our targets. You need to set your targets. Now, to set the targets, I need to equally know, well, what do I need to get there? Supposing I say it's to be in the top 10%, supposing that's our target, mm -hmm. then I need to have a concept of a distance to metric. That distance now says, this is where I am. This is how far I need to get to that threshold I'm talking about. What will it take? How much will it cost? And that now defines, as it were, the entirety of what the government now needs to decide. If this is the target, how do I get it into my budget, into my planning, and how do I start now getting the funds to be able to get that to do? So that foundation, which is the measure better to target better, requires, as it were, data or knowledge. And uh, that is where we enter the picture. We have actually started the process of a data hub, which I imagine will grow into a knowledge hub that will be everything Caribbean, everything CARICOM at the CDB that now can be used for this evidence-based decision-making that we are talking about. So that's the foundation. And then to use that foundation, you need facilitators. Mm -hmm. What can facilitate our pathway to getting to that resilience that we talked about? And one of those facilitators is simply partnerships. Mm -hmm. We cannot overnight leapfrog on our own, because then you need to build a base. And building that base where there's resources, skills, takes time. By the time you get there, it's already history. The world has moved on. So we need to think of mobilizing and leveraging partnerships across the world, regional stakeholders. And, yes, stakeholders, um, institutions, knowledge providers, financiers, as a means now of saying, suddenly overnight we have mushroomed our control of resources available. And that now can help us tackle some of the big ticket items we are talking about. Another facilitator is governance. The stronger your governance structure, the better you will be able to effect and generate uh, those things that we are talking about. So even if the list you read has a number of things in there, it really is about what are the three, four resilience targets that you have, building that foundation, and you'll be doing that from now until it's not going to end, and working on the facilitators, like the governance and the partnerships and the ability and agility of thought of changing the culture, the, the mindset of the people. It's those facilitators that will eventually help us to be able to reach those resilience buckets and generate the sustained growth that we, we are talking about. So I, I like to think of it as three. Dr. Leon, Foundation, facilitator, ultimate goal, which is the resilience buckets. As can be seen, I'm actually enjoying this lesson yeah. uh, because yeah. you've just taken me back to school days yeah. again, yeah. measuring uh, in terms of getting uh, to your root and de defining yeah. Um, the, the, the way you get to uh, your objective, yeah. uh, measurement of time and time over distance exactly. equals speed. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. And um, yeah. we're going to be talking now about how the bank uh, touches Caribbean citizens, because in all that we have done here, we have, you know, mentioned phrases and concepts and philosophies and uh, Millennium Development Goals, yeah. Special Development Goals. Um, these are not issues that the average citizen sure. of the bank's member yeah, uh, countries would take time off sure. to uh, 
to consider. So how do you explain all what we've been discussing to the average Caribbean citizen in yeah. the uh, member countries who don't who didn't go to college or university, have to work more than eight hours a day every day for a living and uh, just don't have the time on their hands yeah. to keep up with the changes in yeah. regional and international banking, financial and economic developments uh, that matter to them yeah. and that really affect them. So how do you convince us mm -hmm. uh, that the CDB is not just another costly, uh, well-paying, big, broad, massive, and large bureaucratic, regional, multinational, and multilateral banking entity, but a regional institution that touches each and every one of us every day. Well, I mean, you, you, you pose a very good question, but if, if somebody could rattle out all of those adjectives about the bank. I mean, they obviously have a lot of time to think. But um, <laughs> but no. But we're um, talking about average citizens. Yeah, yeah. But but please, um, the the average citizen. Let, let's equally be clear. It, it should not be. It should not be their job to to find out mm -hmm. about what the bank is doing. Um, their role is to benefit. Their role should be one to benefit and be be told. Mm -hmm. And I, I think um, that's an area we we probably have not done enough of. Um, so much so that I I believe if you were to do a, a a quick survey along the street and say to people you meet, um, do you know what CDB is? Don't tell them the full Caribbean Development Bank. Just CDB. I think you'd probably find 90% of people would probably not know. Mm -hmm. And if you went further and said, well, CDB is the Caribbean Development Bank, do you know what it does or where it is? I probably think another 90% would probably not know. Which tells me that we have not done a good job in telling and reminding and telling and reminding people what the bank is about, how it touches their lives, what's going on. And um, I, I think that's a, a, an element that is weak at CDB, but equally weak in an entire policy space. So much so that I, I tend to argue communications is the missing policy in economic policy. Mm -hmm. you, you cannot say, I have fiscal and monetary and exchange rate and all these other How policies, do you communicate that and message? you cannot communicate it. Mm -hmm. So we need to elevate communications policy to equal footing with other policies. Mm -hmm. And so for me at the bank, and I have um, charged my communications group, I need to see communications, outreach, sharing of what we do, just as important as a loan and whatever technical assistance we are providing. And so <clears throat> their job is to make sure that we reach the man on the street. Now, we will have to think of innovative ways of making sure we can reach all the audiences, whether it is print or digital or verbal, but communication sharing has to be paramount. Um, I was even giving them a, a simple thing like we are undertaking a project, building a school. What better way to be able to convey that by taking pictures. And it doesn't have to be a fancy um, photographic line. A, a, simple, a simple phone, telephone, um, or mobile phone uh, capture of that project from the time you break ground at different stages all the way up to when the ribbon is cut. Mm -hmm. Now, supposing you simply put those together in a data bank. At the end of the story, you bundle it as a series of slides. From you, beginning, from to, beginning end. to end, you now have a visual of what does it mean to build a school, an immediate lecture for any student learning to know about construction. When I see a building, it didn't just happen. These are the stages mm -hmm. of occurring. And if you have a before and an after picture, you can get a sense of transformation, what it did to a community. So we can start thinking more about those, start telling people and making little stories, reaching out to communities, let people tell the story, what was life like before. Mm -hmm. We have a basic needs trust fund that 
focuses on improving small communities, um, getting rid of or changing, reducing poverty and making livelihoods more sustainable, community-based. What if we could get them to simply say what was life like before, life now? And that is a story we should be telling. So we are building this concept of storytellers, um, building the idea of reaching out, explaining things in language appropriate for the audience. Mm -hmm. And if we can do that, then I think over the years, it won't happen overnight. Over the years, I would like to see us at a point where CDB is not only the institution that was charged, mandated to um, ensure the harmonious economic development of the countries, but that the people of these countries know CDB is that institution that helps develop mm -hmm. these countries. And they should be able to see it, identify with it, live it, feel it, and be able to tell a story about it. Mm -hmm. So communications there for me is key. And as I said, I think we should be uh, being proactive and putting that information out, not expecting the person to go searching and, and so on. There'll be people who want to do searching, and the data hub and so on will help that process of discovery, but we should equally now be allowing the passive recipients to be flooded, as it were, with information that will give them a sense of um, where the where where the bank fits and into And encourage them to bank. feel and, yes. not just touched, but also yeah. Uh, yeah. be involved. Yeah. Because I can't tell you. Um, uh, from my experience uh, with the bank uh, before your mm -hmm. arrival mm -hmm. um, over several decades, yeah. is that the number of programs that the bank has um, in every borrowing member mm -hmm. state, mm -hmm. uh, you have your individual national programs, you have yep. regional programs, programs and yep. then they're yep. broken down into everything from yep. economic and financial programs mm -hmm. down to your cultural yep. innovations, yep. et cetera, et yep. cetera. And like you said, um, the ability to tell those stories um, in, in a messaging form yep. Yep. Uh, that will uh, bring the information about the appreciation sure. of yep. the banks work to the staff, yep. to your over 200 staff, yep. they yep. would, you know, get a chance to see yep. the effect uh, yes. of their work. Yep. Um, there yep. is evidence of that. Um, I could also um, indicate that, you know, from your arrival here, um, the department uh, has been working. I did get to know yesterday that you had uh, met with the Prime Minister and Minister of Finance, uh, the uh, entire cabinet of ministers yeah. and so on. We'll get back to that later, but yeah. I'd like to go to one of the central points that I was glad to hear you say um, doesn't cower you, mm -hmm. and you will not treat it like most people do as something that confuses us so much that we just give up and hope it goes away. Yeah, yeah. And I'm talking about COVID. Um, your COVID strategy. <clears throat> uh, the bank is committed under your leadership to ensure uh, borrowing member countries survive COVID, but also to recover. Yeah survival and recovery earlier you were, you, we were applying that to your 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 outlook yeah. and um the question is how has the first 100 days been against yeah. the background of the cumulative effects of the 17 months of the pandemic yeah. across the region and with the Delta variant having landed or heading for virtually every member state, yeah. to what extent might you have to go back to the drawing board at Wildy? Would, 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 that, would that require? I know you've said you're not going to see it as a stumbling block, but there's a difference between sure. what you would like to see and what actually is. Sure. Yeah, no, there, there's no need to, to go back to the stumbling block, to the, to drawing, the drawing board, board. Uh, purely because I think when, and we, I, we should not be seeing it as a 100-day event. Because yes, it's true, we've had COVID now for maybe 18 months, months, 18, 18 months, months or yeah. thereabouts. Mm -hmm. uh, when COVID started, I think there was probably no one that was thinking 
COVID would still be around. In a year's time. Okay, they, that was not there. And so the solutions that were being put forward for COVID at that time was one, this is likely to be temporary. Um, so let's first focus on keeping people alive. Mm -hmm. So spend money on health systems, purchase medication, um, PPEs, the protective uh, equipment, um, and then livelihoods in terms of businesses. If a business, because you had to be shutting down and you didn't want the spread, so activity, commerce was obviously squeezed. So they would say, well, let's give institutions the means to, to continue to survive. Um, and that took different forms, whether it was um, allowing banks to forbear on, on loans or giving tax breaks or deferring taxes so that those ins or giving grants so those institutions could, could stay. But that very message was super clear. Mm -hmm. You could not obviously sustain that for a long time. Um, and so what was meant to be rescue mm -hmm. before you started recovery has now become almost prolonged or permanent rescue mode. Mm -hmm. And so while we started that way, I think there was always in the back of people's minds a sense that you needed to start recovery going forward. And recovery meant now, how do I reduce change, whatever the extra debt, for example, that I would have uh, built to give people social protection, look after the businesses, increase expenditure on, on health and, and so on. But you cannot obviously sustain that. So we were looking and knew all along that debt ratios were going to jump. And um, even in the case of St. Lucia or the region as a whole, debt GDP ratios rose by a good 20 percentage points, um, putting almost every country in danger zone. Now, the question I think what we needed to think through a little more is, what if COVID did not end? Mm -hmm. What if COVID took five years to clear out? Could we sustain those debt levels at that higher elevated level? And obviously the answer to that is probably no. Mm -hmm. um, now, what does that mean? Does that mean you default or does that mean you forbear? Or does that mean you now say, I need strong commitments in policies that when we turn the COVID corner, you will actually now start to rebalance and get yourself to a particular state. And so I think that concept was there, maybe not fully articulated. Mm -hmm. And what we did at the bank was follow that same narrative, that same script. We provided loans. Uh, what we call our policy-based loans. We provided emergency loans. We provided grants. And we did um, re debt relief, whereby countries that owed the bank, we put a pause to say, you, you don't pay us now, or at least for a year, to at least give you room and time to use those funds to do, to do something else. But mm -hmm. that one year is over, mm -hmm. yeah? Mm -hmm. And so now we need to be thinking, I guess, your question, what do we do now? Do we reinstate that? And if you reinstate it now, what does it mean for the bank? As is a balance sheet. Mm -hmm. But if you don't reinstate it, what does it mean for the government? Mm -hmm. And that now need to start paying that still have the same COVID uh, expenses and now a higher debt because they've had to borrow over that year. So what does it mean? It means that, uh, to be very blunt, um, a, a number of countries, their fiscal position is rather tenuous. Because the, the, um, the point where you allow them room to do something that they should not ordinarily have been doing to manage COVID, expecting COVID would have been shorter, now is prolonged, means that these governments are going to struggle. And so we do need to dig deep, deep, deep in and help 
think with them. But what um, about conditionality? Um, in a situation where you're giving a, a one-year um, grace period, mm -hmm. uh, can you as the bank say to the borrowing member state, listen, we're giving you that one-year grace period, but um, while we say you can use it to do things you would not normally have had the money mm -hmm. to, we could also say to you there are things you cannot do with it. Yeah. I mean, we could say that, and I mean, general, there has always been equally the expectation. I remember um, George Eva, the managing director of the IMF, uh, popularizing the phrase, spend but keep the receipts. Ah. So, um, you, because there will need to be, there will need to be audits. There will need to make sure that the money was well spent. It, it is not just giving an open checkbook. It was spend but spend on a particular item. Mm -hmm. uh, the, because the first and foremost objective was to sustain keep people alive. Mm -hmm. you know, that was the, the first objective. Now the objective is maybe not just keep people alive, it is now put in place the systems that can sustain that. So there's a little pivoting that's taking place, a little rebalancing that's taking place. But I want to bring something to your attention. Uh, we cannot focus on rescue and recovery and stop. Mm -hmm. We have to do the full line. Mm -hmm. it's, Rescue, life recovery, recovery, and repositioning. Mm -hmm. And that is now where this thing gets uh, really, really complicated. Because recovery is not growth. And let me, let me explain that to you. Recovery is not growth. Um, take the case of St. Lucia, which we can understand. In 2020, we had a 20% fall in GDP. So let's say we're at 100. 20% means we are down at 80, numbers-wise. Mm -hmm. How do we get back to 100? Requires 25% growth. You fall by 20, but you have to grow by 25. Mm -hmm. That 25 is not going to occur in one year. It's not going to occur in two years. I would wager it probably would not occur in no more than, no less than four years. Because on average, we have not been growing six, seven, eight, nine, ten percent a year. Percent annually. Okay? Mm -hmm. So, but the key point here to note is that four years of recovery, yeah, four years of recovery has not gotten you any further than where you were back to before. your 100%. Back to your 100, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. So if I look now at the time series, and I'm talking of growth over time, mm -hmm. and I get to the point of 2019 pre-COVID, and I get to 2024, let's say, post-COVID, assuming it's post, mm -hmm. and I am still at 100, you it shows grown. zero growth. You haven't grown. Zero growth, mm -hmm. okay? But over those four years, I have been growing, <laughs> if you want, three, five, six percent. Recovering. But you are recovering from that disaster that 20%. hit you. Uh -huh. And it's not just recovering. You've been spending money, investing, borrowing, mm -hmm. borrowing, mm -hmm. increasing debt mm -hmm. to get that recovery but at no growth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we cannot ignore the second phase, the uh, third stage, mm -hmm. the repositioning to genuinely grow beyond that 100 that we had. Mm -hmm. And that is where the calculus gets very, very tricky. Mm -hmm. the government packages need to see the rescue function, need to see the implications of recovery, and now need to see the repositioning beyond where you now have genuine growth because our ultimate goal is not recovery. Mm -hmm. Our ultimate goal is not zero growth. Mm -hmm. Our ultimate goal, as we said, is... Repositioning. No, sustained, sustained, sustained mm -hmm. economic growth. Repositioning for sustaining Absolutely. economic growth. Absolutely. So it is that marriage that we need to keep in mind and policy makers need to see. Because you may have to make decisions that start the process of repositioning while you are undertaking the process of recovery, mm -hmm. even while at the same time you are undertaking rescue. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, and a, a quick line, you, you have a, 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 a building that collapses and you're starting your, you're starting your rescue operation. You are sending in the detractors, and they are now digging for hopefully survivors. At that time, you are equally starting the process of, so where will I house those people? Do I have um, the necessary shelters, or the hospital, or the, the food supplies? And after you've done that, you are equally at the same time now saying, I need to be starting to think codes, building codes, how do I make sure that doesn't happen in the future? My resilience mm -hmm. concept, okay? But all of those three things are happening even if we are only seeing one, the rescue. The rescue. Which yeah. is these guys going in. Mm -hmm. But the genuine policy makers now are handling all three things at one and the same time. And it's the same story with COVID. We, we have to be thinking policies that are tackling rescue, recovery, repositioning for the future at one and the same time. Mm -hmm. It's not sequential, mm -hmm. but it means you're doing more than the average person is expecting you to do, and it means you need more resources. Gives me two, two, two uh, examples that I, I can apply here. Um, one is that uh, from time immemorial, we've grown as Caribbean people to expect hurricanes mm -hmm. season every year. Mm -hmm. And the level uh, we've been uh, prepared mm -hmm. over the years is yeah. to prepare for the hurricane. Pre precisely. Have your food precisely. Kit precisely. ready and have yeah. your uh, groceries. Yeah. Um, but it is. It has never gone beyond mm -hmm. the expected damage. Yeah. How do we recover and yeah. reposition? Yeah. Um, I have a, a very good um, local investor friend who uh, makes the point is that you people walk around the town and they see uh, empty lots. But every empty lot he sees, he imagines what he can build on it. Imagination again. <laughs> Okay. Imagination. Yeah, and okay. um, because that that potentially is the seed of tomorrow. Mm -hmm. um, and if he keeps that imagination dream going, he'll start thinking of design, purpose, mm -hmm. why, who will sit in that space, what do they want, mm -hmm. how can I make them happy? So that fertile imagination mm -hmm. is the the beginning, the creation, the seeds that takes us to the next phase of creation. Mm -hmm. That is innovation. It is that we have to embrace. But, uh, and now you, you mentioned this. Um, I'm not just saying we need to imagine. Remember I said that our focus is on education. We have to start thinking really, how do we change our education systems? Mm -hmm. What to, do we teach? What do we teach? How do we teach it? Mm -hmm. So that students that are growing from primary through secondary to vocational, tertiary, have this inquiring mind uh, that talks about now discovery and problem solving mm -hmm. and imagination and thinking outside of what we know. Because that is the only way we can advance, mm -hmm. is thinking beyond what we know. When we are operating strictly in wh what we know, we are passive users of knowledge. What we need is to transform ourselves to active creators of knowledge. Mm -hmm. And that is the sense of innovation. That is why I am saying learning education is so critical. And that is the one space, Earl, um, that again we, we, we have been missing. Is the one space that we do not have a comparative disadvantage. We, we lament small size. We are too small, we cannot compete. We lament we haven't got resources. We cannot compete, so be it. But if we have no comparative disadvantage in knowledge creation, why can't we focus on using knowledge creation, knowledge services as a way of competing and can compete globally? Why not? Oh, and we can. And we can. And we can. Precisely the point. We, we can. can. Because I, I have. We can. I have for the last 25 years been saying to the respective people in charge at the Ministry of Education um, following regime change every five years mm. that uh, as a journalist, every year I looked out for the results of the annual science 
competitions mm -hmm. where students, mm -hmm. secondary students, mm -hmm. are asked to come up with innovative solutions mm -hmm. to problems. Right, right. And then yeah. they go through, through the yeah. innovative yeah. thought process. Yes. Mm -hmm. They come up mm -hmm. with experiments. They yeah. identify problems in the community or the yeah. country. Yeah. And they come up yeah. with the solutions, yeah. solutions that work yeah. because they win the prizes, because sure. the judges sure. have judged that they won. Yeah. But my problem mm -hmm. is that by the time they have won the prize, yeah. it goes into a back room. Yeah. So and this, this, is, this, is where, this is where I think when I say an innovation hub. Mm -hmm. That's my dream. Can the region be that place where innovative ideas not only are created, but can now be effected, sold mm -hmm. as strategies mm -hmm. that can be patented and earn funds? Mm -hmm. We don't have to do everything. Mm -hmm. We are small. We cannot in essence, build everything. But what if we can just be creators, thinkers, that can produce those, have them sold? We can be exporting capital. Mm -hmm. And there's no reason why we cannot do that. Rather, than, rather than being in a situation where um, um, we have learned to, to live with the fact that the steel band copyright is in Japan. Precisely. Now, why, why, <laughs> did, this, why did this ever happen? When we have all of this knowledge of steel pan, music, architecture, tuning, and so on, in Trinidad, we didn't take it to the next step mm -hmm. of one, pulling out the relevant elements of this that can now be said to be the discovery element of the knowledge, mm -hmm. and didn't take it to the strategy level, mm -hmm. where we now say we can create strategies, create industries, out of this, somebody had to come from Japan to see the benefit, the knowledge that's in there, the opportunity, and now create patents that are in Japan. I mean, this is, I, I think, a, a, a real missed opportunity. But we, we have the potential to build on that. Mm -hmm. And if we can say this is our focus, we can have a totally different development paradigm where we can genuinely compete and takes us outside of the box of boundaries. Because now, part of our problem of small size and boundaries is we operate in jurisdictions. Mm -hmm. uh, what I think the digital divide has provided, which is why, for me, that digital an connectivity <laughs> is you have an unbounded space. Mm -hmm. There are no boundaries, no limits. Mm -hmm. And we, we need to be thinking big. Why do we need to say our diaspora, diaspora? I'd prefer to think of them as just people living somewhere on the planet. Mm -hmm. And we should be able to have the diaspora work for At us. home elsewhere. Work elsewhere. We've mm -hmm. just done remote working in COVID. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. At least that's a start. Mm -hmm. Why can't we then say somebody in New York who is Caribbean, wants to work on the Caribbean, can stay and enjoy living in New York, but is working in the region, mm -hmm. all through connectivity, connectivity. of digital um, mm -hmm. technology. But it will raise the question of whose product is that work? Mm -hmm. um, who do they pay taxes to? Who controls, regulates, manages what that person does, doesn't do? So there'll have to be a, a very big um, concerted uh, aspect of governments now to start talking of harmonization of digital spaces because it's no longer ownership of sovereign territory that we are talking about. But just think of what it might mean in terms of our ability now to, as we said, genuinely compete in creation of knowledge products across the world. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, we have people at every university I can think of that have stood toe to toe with the best and the brightest of any Everywhere. other country and anywhere. anywhere in the world. Now, if we have demonstrated we can do that, mm -hmm. right? And no one can turn around and say, no, the Caribbean people didn't do well. We have demonstrated mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. Why can't we utilize, leverage that, and now say, let's take this. Now, I don't want to say we are better. So I mean, don't want to use comparative advantage. We do not have a comparative disadvantage. disadvantage. OK, we do not have. Mm -hmm. So at least on an equal level playing field, let us leverage that. 
And I think we can leverage that through the power of reimagination, mm -hmm. noting that our only limit or constraint is our unbounded imagination, in, in a sense. Um, and then we can say, let's now rebalance where we are mm -hmm. towards putting us in that other space, but now reposition for the future, building that future, creating it. Mm -hmm. You know, as uh, someone once said, you, your best way to predict the future is to create it. And well, I, think, I think we have an opportunity to create it. And we, we, all of you, what you've said has proven that we, yeah. we do have that opportunity. Um, realities, the reality stares us in the face. Yeah. And what we've been talking to up to now mm -hmm. are the things that we can do, yeah. mm -hmm. the things that we can manage, yeah. the things yeah. that we can create. Yeah. Um, uh, I'd like to move into one area. Mm -hmm. Time is still on our side, but we have to manage it. Mm -hmm. And I want to go into climate change, mm -hmm. because climate change continues to change life across the region uh, with global warming and rising sea levels more frequent and devastating weather patterns, while the tectonic plates continue to shift below Haiti. Uh, how is the bank addressing the need to help member states recover and build resilience after suffering hurricane damages, earthquakes, and volcano eruptions uh, in those in these even more perilous times. Yeah. Um, what assurances did you yeah. give Dr. Gonzalez? <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean we 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 have to be able one to to say to to countries that we have to continue to look for resources. Um, that can meet crisis situations, whether it's the earthquake or hurricane. So we need, we need funding in a bucket, if you can call it a disaster resilience um, type bucket that is specifically earmarked for that. Mm. But that really falls in the rescue mode. Mm. Uh, when, it comes to, when it comes to recovery, now you want to be able to say equally to governments, we need to have a separate, if you want, bucket of funds that now can help you recover. Um, and that may very well mean funds on a, a different set of conditions, funds uh, maybe that are provided in trust or otherwise from donors and, and that kind of stuff. And, and drawn down on only at yeah, points at, of need. Exactly, at points of need. And then there will be, as it were now, other funding uh, bucket streams that can say now governments in their own line want to do certain projects. It could be um, individual, but I think we need to start thinking more the regional projects mm -hmm. that can help address one of my equal areas, the integration, as to how we can become uh, we can get more benefits from that integration uh, project that, that we have. Uh, so the climate change part is, is live. We, we need to see it not as something we can do on our own. And so the concept of partnerships with, for example, Green Climate Fund, um, the European Investment Bank, uh, the various donors and institutions that are providing funds for climate-related activity, um, equally within our own space, what governments can provide by incentives that can help, for example, renewable energy as a means of tackling um, emissions, which eventually can help indirectly reduce uh, climate change. I mean, th it's, it's a whole mix. Mm -hmm. And I think what we can do here is simply to be able to, one, know everything we need to know about climate change. Mm -hmm. And so I think we need to be a, a look at Which is point. a learning process. It's a learning process, but at the same time... But there's, there's enough around that we can work There's enough around with. now that you can pull, call it, um, have it housed in one place, and now say we, we are a locus point for climate change studies, mm -hmm. uh, climate mm -hmm. change policy. Because uh, it reveals itself impacts. in so many ways exactly. across the region. So I'd, I'd like again to see the bank uh, take that space. Um, we, we don't want to be the, the scientific um, aspect of climate. I mean, university has those centers and people who are studying this, but we should be able to co-opt them, partner with them into a CDB concept that now looks at implications, impact 
own economies and what sorts of policies can be now used to build climate resilience um, and how we can facilitate that, whether it's through projects, through building stronger sea defenses and uh, that, that sort of stuff. But um, we, we are in the space, we are looking to broaden it, looking for funding to strengthen it. And um, the governments are equally told every step along the way that we are with them. Uh, we will provide whatever support we can. And where we don't have and we can reach out to other institutions, we'll do that to try to channel resources and knowledge to the, the borrowing member countries. Yeah. Well, let's go into uh, that other aspect of the interview um, that uh, our viewers will um, certainly uh, enjoy as much as they have with the ways in which you have simplified uh, the lessons about um, the bank, its mission, your vision, um, your, your starting off, and of course, um, we've heard from you how your first 100 days um, have gone. But finally, you're back home again. <coughs> yep. And like Sir Arthur, as a visitor mm -hmm. to your homeland, mm -hmm. The job involving you living in and out of a suitcase from country to country, continent to continent over the past 35 years and now back in the region like Sir Arthur did, mm -hmm. you live and work in and out of Barbados. Mm -hmm. So what's a visit home like for you, meeting family and friends and fellow youth and students from uh, the A-level college, now the Sir Arthur Lewis Community College, driving around the island, going to the Castries market, climbing the pitons, or none of the above, and simply R and R and R and R, meaning rest and rest and more rest and relaxation. Yeah. Maybe all of the above, but um, no, this trip in particular, um, there, there hasn't been any time for R&R. It's not a holiday. It's not a holiday. So um, I'd want to separate this trip from, um, from, I would say, future trips. Barbados is close by. Mm -hmm. I'd love to be able to come home fairly um, regularly. Uh, one of the things I haven't done, um, you mentioned the pitons. I've climbed it a few times, grow piton. But I, I'd love to do uh, Mon Jimmy at some point. Mm -hmm. um, so I would, I would maybe target that as one of my, my, my future trips. Well, I'll keep but mine at piton meter. <laughs> <laughs> That's more manageable. But no, I mean, for, for this trip, probably I, I'll be here until Monday morning. So I definitely want to go down to Shoezel to see my aunt. Um, I have two aunts in the, in the village. Uh, that would probably be family related. Mm -hmm. I have a brother who is um, up here that I will see, mm -hmm. uh, you know, Calix, um, mm -hmm. Leon. Mm -hmm. um, so that's probably about it. But in terms of the R&R, &R, the, the um, entertainment side, getting to meet friends and so on, I think that will probably have to be uh, on a second. At a, at a, at a, at a later yes. time. Yes. In uh, fact, like we said earlier, um, you've, heard, you've met the Prime Minister and Minister of Finance, the entire cabinet. Mm -hmm. um, you have reiterated the bank's mission and uh, purpose, including uh, assisting all yeah. member countries yeah. to not only go through uh, COVID, but also to recover. Um, but one of the uh, things you've found time to do mm -hmm. is to uh, visit your old alma mater. And how will that feel? You haven't done it, but I'm sure you intend to speak to while here some of your fellow students and uh, while they all admit that you topped the class, one noted that uh, what he called back then, he said you had a photographic memory. <laughs> so uh, what made you top class, meaning at the top of the class? Was it your memory or your brain? I have no idea. <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't know, actually. Um, I think I, I used to study, study hard. Um, although sometimes when I think back, I, I'm not sure how much I did, to be honest. Um, I can tell you, you did a lot, because those I've spoken to all refer to you as uh, being at the top of the class. Yeah. One said that uh, in, in, in the field of uh, economics, mm -hmm. um, they would come to you to ask about whether a point was right <laughs> or wrong, and you would recite an entire chapter. 
<laughs> um, to them. Um, but um, I'm sure you're going to enjoy uh, moving around at your alma mater. My final uh, issue I want to uh, raise with you is that, you know, when you first pack your, your suitcase to put your schooling to work abroad, you must mm. have had an ultimate objective and goal in mind. Did you ever see yourself following in Sir Arthur's footsteps heading the Caribbean Development Bank after 35 years of practically living out of your suitcase from country to country and continent to continent? Not, not, not really. Um, I think Sir Arthur got on my radar much, much later. When I was, um, after I'd finished actually my, my first degree in London, um, I, I got excited about thinking of a, a PhD project um, and I, I reached out to Serafa at that time. And um, I, I was squarely in the, in the zone of, um, I'm going to use a, a, a big word here, econometrics, which is the statistical application and mathematical application of economic theories. Mm -hmm. And um, that was the holy grail, the, the um, perfection and um, if you want would that the, have been science and numbers yes yes <laughs> it, it would be in that sense and i reached out to sir Afra and says i would uh, he was at princeton at the time and said i i really would want him to be my external supervisor because mm -hmm. i i wanted to in a sense follow on him and he wrote back very nicely and said um he he would have loved to do it but he he doesn't he doesn't have any appetite for these equations and econometrics and so i should find somebody that is uh, that is better better schooled in that way. Uh, he didn't recommend ted schultz no 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 but uh, no i i didn't start off there but i think um over time over time the the whole concept of uh, development and advancing which really is what Serafa became known for has been at the front of of, of my mind, um, so much so that now I, I say I have taken this concept of unbounded imagination uh, and the infinite supply of knowledge, mm -hmm. which is the foundation of uh, the, the whole philosophy I've been um, expounding, um, as coming from Serafa's unlimited supplies of labor, mm -hmm. except that the, the labor is not really unlimited in supply. Mm -hmm. The labor is at the agrarian into industrialization, low wage, low value added side. And the knowledge to me is high value added, unlimited boundary. That can take us to the next level in a much different way. And I said that the Unthink seminar we had here a um, couple months ago, if Sir Arthur was around, I am sure he would have seen um, education and knowledge as the golden child uh, for, for development. But at his time, labor, the abundance of labor was what was uh, the, the key. But I think we need to pivot uh, from abundance of labor to unlimited supplies of knowledge and unbounded imagination of our people as what will drive um, development going forward. But I tell you something, yes. Mr. President, yes. um, and this is perhaps the best part of it uh -huh. because Haiti, mm -hmm. I would like to think I'm correct mm -hmm. in saying, is the biggest borrowing member country with a population, population wise, population, um, yeah. uh, of around 10 million at yes. home and abroad today. Sure. Uh, but English isn't their main language. Correct. This is what we've been Talking. communicating yes, with, yes, um, yes. And, 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 and messaging in. Yeah. So how do you assure the Haitians, um, you know, it's, 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 it's citizen victims of tectonic, natural, and human-induced disasters in mm. the age of climate change and mm. uh, changing weather patterns. Mm. Um, how do you tell them uh, that the the CDB is uh, there for them, and they could always bank on that. Ah, are we all? Are we all? Ah. <laughs> um, now, for me, I'm going to do that we have a lot of people who are not going to be able to do that. So, I'm Au fait qu'on était les moitiés ici, qu'on connaissait. Mais ici, avec Dominique Chenkaïkopan. Si, ok, ok, copain. Mais 
peut-être moins qu'à commencer pour dire euh, Jean Etienne Etienne ni une histoire qui qui euh, qui n'est pleine peine um, histoire Eti depuis long longtemps c'est une histoire souffrage et Jean Eti qui a souffert et souffert peut-être plus qui c'est normal pour pour un monde souffrir et euh, malheureusement um, il y a souffert juste toujours. Um, comme nous dit, peut-être le uh, mois passé, il a tenu, um, comme on dit ça, tremblé et tremblé de terre. Oui, um, alors, moi, je dis à Jean Haïtien, qui est copain de Koyol, Koyol saint ici, um, Banque de développement Caraïbe, um, nous l'appuyons. Nous, nous voulons aider à um, baisser le um, baisser, um, souffrage, baisser la uh, peine um, yoka, yoka senti à présent. Et puis, um, nous avons fait tout ça nous paix um, pour, pour aider ça et pour, um, pour faire vie. Um, Jean Etienne, primaire, passé à um, Biotéjani. Um, Uh, depuis depuis long longtemps mais spécialement um, moment ici à présent uh, à présent um, peine peine Jean Etty toi mm. uh, avec tout ça au delà pour Jean Etty qui a appliqué uh, pour Jean Satrici Jean Dominique Jean Trinidad Jean oui, Lagunat oui, tout le monde oui, qui a copain Coyol d'accord une jeune commission yeah, qui yeah. Monsieur Président Banque yeah. Développement Caraïbes bail mm. avec Monsieur Ulbuske encore qui a dit merci pour attention à ce programme là Hodia avec Mekadou encore Monsieur yeah. Président yeah. Euh, nous bien contents pour éducation ou bon nous Hodia avec nous qui souhaité euh, bien en mission. At which point, uh, Dr. Jean Leon, we want to thank you, yeah. President of the Caribbean Development Bank and Chief Executive Officer for agreeing to converse with us yeah. in Castries at the NTN Studios for UE TV Global. And I'm Earl Buske thanking you yeah. for viewing. Yeah. Thank you.